When we are more in tune with our body, when we are not sticking our head in the sand and we address things head on, we have at least the information to figure out how we want to go forward or not, but at least we're empowered that way. Well, hi everyone, Dr. David Perlmutter here. Today we have a very uh, interesting uh, interview with a woman named Samantha Harris. That might be a very familiar name to people. Uh, she hosted Entertainment Tonight, Dancing with the Stars, was a participant in, participant in Dance with the Stars. Uh, she has been on the cover of just about every women's health magazine that you can think of, many of them multiple times. Uh, she tells us a very interesting story how at age 40 she was diagnosed with breast cancer, what that was all about, what it was like, what she learned, and how she realized that uh, you know the, the mainstream response to what she should do or where it even came from was less than satisfactory for her. So she really decided to dig deep and figure out a lot of information that relates to why people get breast cancer, why women get breast cancer, uh, what her options were in terms of surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and how to deal with a diagnosis like that uh, in terms of how it impacts your life and, and really how to be your own advocate. Her book is Your Healthiest Healthy. And, you know, this is a book written by somebody who was seemingly very healthy uh, at the onset and in retrospect realized that she needed to make some pretty significant changes in her lifestyle choices recognizing that for the most part, you wouldn't say that her breast cancer was necessarily genetically uh, predisposed. Uh, that said, she realized that there were a lot of things going on in her life that needed to be cleaned up. Let me tell you a little bit more about Samantha Harris. Millions have watched Samantha Harris co-host Dancing with the Stars and Entertainment Tonight and then share her story of her breast cancer diagnosis at age 40. After the initial shock and recovery from a double mastectomy, she sought answers to why it could have happened and ways to improve her overall health. Now, the Emmy-winning journalist, nutrition advocate, certified personal trainer, and mother of two offers her real-world strategies for overcoming adversity and systemically improving one's total well-being. Your Healthiest Healthy is the name of her book. It combines her humorous, sometimes harrowing, always inspiring journey with research-backed advice, insights from doctors and scientists, and effective tips into an easy-to-follow eight-step guide. Her practical advice will empower readers to eat better, work out smarter, reduce toxins around them, master medical awareness, very important, handle health crises, strengthen relationships, boost positivity, and build resiliency. With this complete program, readers can maximize health, energy, and happiness for life. It's really a terrific, very, very user-friendly book, and I'm hoping uh, that you all will take a look at this. Whether or not you're thinking about doing something about a cancer diagnosis or just really wanting to focus on improving your health, let's jump to our interview. Samantha Harris, last time we talked, uh, you were interviewing me, and now we're uh, turning the table around, and, and I'm having this incredible opportunity to spend time with you today. So thanks for joining us. I uh, just I love being in your presence in any way. And by the way, I am I, I am a diehard fan, as you know. Okay, I have every <laughs> book. I, I couldn't I couldn't hold all of them, but uh, and drop acid your la latest. I've just been devouring. I've been sharing with my your healthiest healthy community, and I just am grateful that you have come on to to be a part of our community. And I'm so excited to be able to share with yours. Well, yours is a is a uh, is an interesting story. It's an empowering story. Uh, it's a story of uh, gratitude and a story of love. And, um, you know, I, I felt that last time we were together, I was, you know, really getting to know you a lot better. But now that I've read your book, um, I know a lot more about you. And I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm really loving what I've learned about you. And, uh, you know, at, we were talking before we went live and I said, I may as well hit the record button. I was saying that... Um, you know, you've been gifted a lot of things, uh, physical health, beauty, intelligence, and all of these opportunities to appear on television and do, you know, satisfy your calling. You, you knew what your skill set was. 
And then, uh, you know, we're blindsided by this uh, diagnosis. And then what did you do with it? You know, you, you realized that you needed to play a role in, in terms of the outcome and what was going on, as was described by your oncologist. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But really empower so many people by your book. And I'll just hold it up again. We saw it in the introduction. And um, you're healthy as healthy. I mean, what a goal. So um, you're age 40. And uh, you had just had a mammogram and an exam. Everything's great. Uh, and then uh, weeks or a couple months later, you find a lump. Why don't you take it from there? Well, and, and actually it was even the shocking part of it was 11 days, 11 days after clear mammogram results. Wow. And again, That's unbelievable. 30, you know, I, it was, you know, and as I've spoken with more and more survivors since my own diagnosis uh, eight years ago, I find that m women find this happening all the time where they go and they're like, oh, wait a second. And they find the lump. And so it's really a testament to how much we need to be in tune with our own bodies, how we need to, you know, it's so easy to stick your head in the sand. And there was part of me that really wanted to do that when I found the lump. But when we empower ourselves to take that control of our health and well-being, and as, as you well know, and I'm sure we'll discuss today, I, I took that idea of taking control of my well-being and ran with it and share it with so many others. But when we are more in tune with our body, when we are not sticking our head in the sand and we address things head on, we have at least the information to figure out how we want to go forward or not. But at least we're empowered that way. Well, I've always been... Uh kind of puzzled by the notion of mammograms in the context of breast cancer prevention. Mammogram is not a preventive strategy at all. It's another form of early detection. And in this case, uh, you actually detected this at the same time the mammogram should have and didn't. I'm not saying people, women shouldn't have mammograms, but the point is, I, I think the language you used in the book was fondle yourself. And I say that not to be glib, I say that in the same context, I think that you brought it up, is you need to go for it. You need to do self-breast exams, and you, know, you talk about that in the book. And you know, in your case, how incredibly important it was. You find the lump, you go to your doctor, what happens next? So I, I, again, just had a mammogram. It was clear. So I went to see my OBGYN, not a breast expert, because why should I? And and that was the doctor who always did the quick clinical touching feeling every time I would go to get my, you know, my pap smear or whatever it was. So that's who I called. She saw me a couple of days later, told me, ah, you're 40. It's probably glandular. This is what happens. You get lumpy breasts. Sent me on my way and said it was nothing. And I sat with this lump for another two months after that. Wow. And thought, okay, I should probably go get another opinion. So again, it's not cancer. I went to see my internist. He did the same thing. Quick clinical exam, sent me on my way, told me it was nothing. And really, Dr. Perlmutter, it wasn't until four months later, because the holidays came, and you know, it gets so busy with all the holidays and New Year's and everything. I came up for air four months after I found that lump, and it was still there. And I thought, okay, this is nagging me. And that's when the inner voice got really loud and I wasn't listening. I was trying to ignore my inner voice saying something's not right. And finally my inner voice stopped whispering and started screaming at me. And I said, okay, I need to go to someone for an opinion. Now it's my third opinion who looks at breasts every day as their one focus, because that person will know what to look for. My husband said that he'd volunteer for the job of someone who looks at breasts every day. I said, honey, you have to go to medical school for that. So it's not going to work. Sorry. <laughs> or at um, least anyway. make it. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. You know, he and I tried to bring as much light into it as we could, because this was obviously something very heavy. And when we went to see that oncologist, she too said, wow, had I been you, I don't know if I would have come to see me. I had you know, negative uh, you know, mammogram for anything. And we had two ultrasounds, a needle biopsy, and even a subsequent MRI, not one test detected the cancer, which is baffling. This is well, when I think in retrospect, it's baffling. I would think, you know, on the front end, not, I mean, a lot of things happen in breasts that are not malignant. As you learned, in fact, having, ultimately having two uh, lesions, learning that one was and one wasn't. So you see that can happen. Right. And, and I think the most important thing, too, is just we have to really go to the experts. So part of it is 
very important, know your own body and take action. But then the next step is don't be afraid to get a second or even third opinion and also try to see the best experts you can. So this is where when I had a, the needle bi biopsy came back with it's not cancer, but it's a proliferation. We're not sure what it is. Let's at least take the lump out. I did have a lumpectomy. Again, woke up from surgery. They said it wasn't cancer, but this is where the expert who is in that surgery is so important. She said, this is the oncologist, she listened to her gut in the moment. And she said, I saw a little area of border that seemed like healthy tissue. And for whatever reason, I just wanted to take a sample of that. And I did. That was invasive cancer, but it didn't look like it under the microscope in the room. And because of that, we now knew, okay, I have to go another step further and either have another lumpectomy, but also add in radiation or a singular double mastectomy, which is ultimately what I chose. So the, uh, what you're saying is in the operating room, the frozen section that they did was not malignant, right. but subsequently the pathology did in fact reveal malignancy. It did. And then you had a variety of opinions thereafter about mm -hmm. what you should do. Exactly. And this is where it really does boil down to what is right for us as an individual. Just because someone else chose a different path of surgical or, or other treatment doesn't mean that's the right path for you. And we really have to weigh what is right for your lifestyle, what is right for uh, your comfort level. So for me, I spoke to many survivors, both who had, had lumpectomy with radiation and single or double mastectomy, different types even of, of that. And I ultimately decided so that I wasn't always looking over my shoulder. And because I knew a couple of women who'd had a double and found cancer on the other side they didn't even know was there mm, unbelievable. let's just have a double mastectomy go through it one time and hopefully god willing be done with it at that point and that's what i chose now we're going to look at an image right now and uh tell us what's what's going on in this image where are you in in the process so this is as I am heading into my second stage of reconstruction surgery. So the mastectomy had happened three months before that. They put in temporary expanders, and then three months later, the permanent implants went in. And they do that so that the, the tissue can build around and you can slowly increase to the size that you want to have for the permanent implant, uh, which was definitely a process, but I, for me, it worked out really well. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> to be sure... After the diagnosis, there was no unanimity in terms of what your treatment options were in terms of mastectomy, one side, both sides, or, or leaving it. And uh, ultimately, you, you, you indicated what you chose, and there was one lymph node positive, as I recall. Yes. Yeah, so we have to have, you know, at least the, the axilla node, the gatekeeper node out in the room. And then if it has cancer, they decide at that point then to try to take other nodes out. So it did test positive uh, with cancer, showed cancer. So they took out 11 lymph nodes total. And thank goodness, none of the other nodes were positive. Um, but once you have one lymph node involvement, all of a sudden your staging is more aggressive. It's right. you know, the, the treatment process is more aggressive. Um, and, and even that, I ultimately had to make some serious decisions, chemo or no chemo, radiation or no radiation. And, you know, do I go on a, an estrogen blocker or do I not? And all of these decisions, I thought the doctor just sits you down and says, here's what you're going to do. Yeah. But because thankfully my tumor size was very small and the tumor itself was very slow growing, it probably been there for years, was not aggressive. A lot of decisions fell back on my husband and me and we had to weigh it and figure out what we were going to do. So this is where a whole sort of stage two of decisions and, and consultations and multiple opinions came in where I sat down with two different radiation oncologists and spoke to two different medical oncologists about whether or not I should or should not do chemo. Uh, and the interesting thing was you get different opinions and then you, have, then you have to also decide what is right for you. So that was the path we, we ended up going down of figuring all of that out. So I think the message is that this is anything but formulaic. I mean, you would think that, you know, there's an exact button you push when a woman has X, Y, Z, and this is exactly what should be done because it's what's done everywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. And this is the right road to follow. And you were, you know, I think surprised to realize that that just isn't the truth. It wasn't the, it wasn't the case at all. And, you know, not to mention, which I sort of haven't said at all, this 
was the most frightening process. My kids were three and six. I had two little girls at home. I lost my dad to colon cancer when he was just 50. And here I was at 40 thinking, well, I am not, at least I was older when he passed. I was 22. They'd had me very young. So I got to grow up with a very strong father figure. I was not going to leave my little babies behind. And so that determination as a mom really kicked in. And there was so much anxiety. I'm a very happy-go-lucky, positive person. And cancer just struck that down in one fell swoop. And I had to figure out how I could stop feeling so riddled with anxiety and fear at every waking moment. Uh, that was if I was if I was able to sleep in the night from it. So it took a concerted effort on my own, you know, kind of really my own psyche, to say, okay, I can't feel like this. This is I don't know how long this road is going to be. And I, in that moment, it was about maybe about three weeks in after my diagnosis, and I just said to myself, you know, this is where positive self talk is so important. I said, what what can I do? Okay, I can look at everything that comes next in this cancer journey with a positive spin. So what's good in this situation? Okay, well, I've got great health insurance. I have a really fantastic support system. That's good. And as you start to speak in that positive way, it feeds on itself. And then I thought, okay, great. That's good. Okay, Samantha, keep going. What else is good? What else is good? Well, we caught it really early. It is still very early stage, even though it's further along than we thought. Still really great. I'm in otherwise great shape because I eat healthfully, because I exercise regularly. My recovery will hopefully be faster. My risk of, of, of complications and surgery should be less. And that helped me switch my brain path, the pathways of all of those negative, riddled with anxiety thoughts to the positive. And that made a huge sweeping difference. A couple of things come, come to mind. I mean, you're saying, well, you were always healthy. And my goodness, was there a, a Women's Health magazine cover that you were not on? You know, it, you you were literally, literally the picture of health. Yeah. But I think that when you deconstructed your lifestyle choices as it related, for example, to diet, uh, you know, eating quickly to go on entertainment tonight or whatever it may be, that, you know, that needed a bit of a cleaning up, that you looked really great. You know, you were thin, had great abs the whole bit. But you realized that there were parts of the program that really needed to be a little bit more fine-tuned, or not even fine-tuned, that there were some significant Overhauled. changes. Yeah. And I want everybody who's watching this right now to realize that um, you did such a great job in the book in terms of making these changes approachable. We'll talk about them. But about how to swap out your uh, cosmetics and house cleaning uh, threats as it relates to cancer, how you changed your diet and how you made it all. And you do, the book is written uh, to make it so approachable by, by really anyone. And, and I like the fact that it's something people would be, should be reading now you know, without a diagnosis, mm -hmm. not that it's not a wonderful turn to book if you've been given that diagnosis because you did such a great job in terms of how do you talk to other people, how do you manage your emotions? How do you talk to children? There was a great section on that. That I, no, Who mentions that? I mean, that's so important, not just your children, but other children in general. But um, ultimately then, uh, you get through this. What was your decision uh, about chemo and how did you work through that? So again, I had multiple recommendations. Interestingly, this is a place where there was agreement between my two medical oncologists. So one of the oncologists actually wrote the foreword for my book, Dr. Dennis Slayman, and he is one of the top researchers in the cancer field. And so I really value his opinion. And he said to me the same thing the other medical oncologist said, which was, you're in a gray area for chemo. It'll probably save you somewhere between three and six percentage points of recurrence. So it'll be in your favor. And I thought at the time, well, I want every percentage point in my favor. I mean, I've got two little kids. I'm going to have chemo. I had put the cold caps, the things that help try to keep your hair from, from falling out as much uh, on hold. I had put a deposit down. I was ready to do that. And then I started to think more long term. And it was four rounds of chemo versus some other women I know who've gone through it, who've had 10, 20, 30 rounds of chemo. So what is the recipe, right? Yeah. Right. And in the oncologist's eyes, as they said to me, oh, it's just four rounds of chemo. You're already in otherwise great shape. You'll do fine. Yeah, you'll lose your hair and some other stuff will happen, but you'll be fine. And then I thought, I know what chemo does to a body. 
And that was at an early stage, well before I became a certified health coach and learned all that I now know eight years later. I am so grateful eight years later that I, I opted not to do chemo. Now, there's something called an ungotype score, and that tells you mostly in postmenopausal women, and I was obviously premenopausal and still am, but uh, what the likelihood is that chemo will help. And I had a very low oncotype score, which basically meant chemo would help a little bit, but maybe not as much as it could if it was a more aggressive tumor. So that also helped give me that insight to say, okay, I feel that I can not do chemo because if God forbid I ever have cancer again, and it's one of those situations where you have a very aggressive tumor and you absolutely need chemo, well, then I'm going to have to go through it, God forbid, then, and I don't want to have to go through it now, too. So I op opted not to do that. The other thing was radiation, and I went to two different radiation oncologists, one who said you absolutely need it, and without it, you'll have a 20% chance of local recurrence. Walked down to that appointment with my husband. We said, well, guess I'm doing radiation, and mm -hmm. that would have been, I think, 30 or 40 uh, rounds, you know, five days a week for many weeks in a row. And then I went to, and that was someone, and I don't want to be uh, cynical. I, I think that the, the doctor really meant what he felt, that that was the right way, the right course. But he was in an independent situation where he had to keep the lights on. And this is sort of my post, my post reflection. Yeah, then I went it, to it, you might think that you're being cynical. On the other hand, what, you, what you're saying now is real. And, you know, the other thing is there's an old saying that when your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? Mm. And so that's what yes. they do. If you go to a surgeon, you should be chill. expecting an operation. You go to a radiation oncologist, you should be expecting, you know, radiation therapy. So yes. that's reality. And, and I but think again, go ahead. Well, I was going to say then, but then I went to UCLA. So UCLA, being that it is a... A university they're on salary they're not keeping the lights on they don't need to have a quota that they have to fill of how many patients they give radiation to in order to keep their job and the moment she sat down with me she said you don't need radiation but here's why two new studies just came out and this is now eight years ago from md anderson and sloan kettering you know the two of the top of course you know this but uh -huh. for your I'm uh, loving years it. top uh, oncology institutions in the in the world saying that you don't need it because these two studies took tumor size into consideration. That statistic of 20% local recurrence didn't take tumor size into consideration. So these studies say, well, you can have it, but it's not going to do you any good. So it's up to you if you want it and you feel comfortable having it, great. If you don't, you don't need it. And I walked out saying, <laughs> thank goodness that's one thing I can wipe off my plate. So a couple things I'll mention. <clears throat> First is... There is a huge difference between saying you don't need radiation and saying you don't need radiation and here's why. The, the, the first is basically an emotional response uh, based upon the experience of that individual. The second thing provides the science. And here's why. It's not that I happen to feel one way or the other, but here's what the science is showing. And as it relates to tumor size, I think that's really actually very important because size of a tumor is a representation of what we call the doubling time. And it indicates how, lo how long has that tumor been uh, replicating in your body. We know that it's happening for a while just based upon the length of time between when you first discovered it. And secondly, that it now has spread at least to one regional lymph node. So that, that time course is, you know, is actually very, very important. I also want to go back to the foreword of your book that was written by one of your oncologists. And he said something that was very um, important. He talked about the three kind of characteristics or things that are important in, in dealing with cancer. And point number three was that there's so much more beyond being a patient that the person needs to do. And that's what your book is about. It's about what do you do beyond being the patient? When I say being a patient, it's being the good patient. And that is something that you know, uh, we as doctors w would always want to have is the good patient, meaning the compliant patient, meaning the patient who would basically shut up and do what he or she was told. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, hearing stories in the day about, oh, I was about to, you know, look, seeing this person came into my office and he or she brought in all this stuff, you know, about their problem and wanted me to read it. And I don't have time for that. 
And I realized uh, in looking back that, you know, my patients, this was even in the pre uh, Dr. Google days, the patients would bring me stuff and I would learn a heck of a lot, you know, and it would open up doors for me. I've always said that I've been able, I'm grateful that I've learned more from my patients than they have learned from me because, you know, in our modern medical world, it's, it's 12 to 15 minutes, 15 minutes on the outside that you get and you had better fit into a category so I can respond immediately. You say one thing, I'll give you the, the pill or the treatment or whatever it may be and out the door you go. So what a blessing that you ended up with a, a, an individual who said, this is what you don't need, but more importantly, and here's why, and was up to date with the literature. So there you go. That, and that's, I think, one of the best things about being able to have a teach, teaching institution accessible, right? Because they have yeah. to be up to date on the latest literature and all the studies coming out. And that was, I really, I, I still feel, and I haven't done this and I having this conversation reminds me, I really want to write that letter, right? To say, because I think sometimes too, they don't realize the good that they're doing to us as patients by giving us the I would definitely write that letter. Yeah. Uh, and I would be very public about it. And, um, you know, cause it's not that common. Uh, yeah. So I, I would I would definitely do that, and I think it would make them feel good. And you know, it's it's tough for physicians to get out of their lane uh, when they've gone to medical school and done their residency program, and realize that there is a set doctrine of practice that they are going to pursue. They can't deviate from them because they might get called out. They might be uh, you know, practicing in such a way that doesn't conform to specific guidelines, God forbid. And they don't ever want to appear to have changed their messaging. But that's exactly what, here's your doctor who says to you, you don't need radiation because here's new information. You know, a year ago, she might have said, uh, you don't, well, maybe you do need radiation. I don't really have the answer. But now there's an answer for you based on newer information. You know, I've been called out because I used to say that we should all be on a low-fat diet. That was what I did say 25 years ago. Then I changed my messaging, as you did in your book, saying that, as a matter of fact, fat is really important in the diet, but the quality and the type of fat, of course, matters. Changed the messaging, and I've been called out saying, oh, we can't believe Dr. Promoter. He changed his messaging. My gosh, don't you want your doctor to stay on top of things like your radiation specialist at UCLA who said, hey, now we know. So, so there you go. Getting to diet. Uh, yeah. I think it's fair to say that from your description in the book uh, that what you were eating on set uh, during your hectic entertainment tonight days or whatever it was, wasn't ideal. So in retrospect, what, what are your thoughts on what you were eating? That everything was wholly wrong and totally backwards. I mean, bet between you know the, what's in the, at, on the set of Entertainment Tonight or at the craft service table at uh, Dancing with the Stars, you have to be so careful, especially when you're in that environment. But that doesn't mean it's not isolated to television show sets. The break room at any office. I mean, back in my early days when I was totally. you know, pounding the pavement auditioning, I worked at an office as a day job as a talent management company. And I started my day with coffee from the, from the little coffee maker. Then remember those, uh, you know, I'm just going to call out. Can I, can I call out a brand? Is that okay? A brand that I think totally. that I We're say having, don't. It's free, freedom of speech. I, <laughs> well, so you guys remember those low-fat snack wells, those little you know vanilla sure. sandwich cookies? They looked like an Oreo, but they were wrecked. I would eat an entire row of snack wells, Whoa. and then I would have my turkey bacon that I would. Well, actually, this is when I would. Then I was at E News, and I was at E uh, the E Network, and I would stink up the entire room of our break room because they had a little toaster that was a convection oven and I would toast seven I could fit exactly seven slices of turkey bacon on the tray and this wasn't even like organic nitrate free anything that I would even think to recommend people to level up if they still couldn't get away from it today this was just your you know big brand nasty gross turkey bacon. and I would eat my seven strips of turkey bacon because I wanted as much protein I was on Dancing with the Stars I wanted to feel like oh I was cu as cut as the dancers and looked amazing like them. So I was eating protein from animals, 21 out of 21 meals a day. Breakfast wow. was always turkey bacon or yogurt or, um, you know, eggs. And then lunch and dinner was always a chicken, a turkey, or some sort of fish or sushi. And I didn't realize that this massive quantity 
of animal protein. Sure, I had some fruit and sure, I had some vegetables, but like I, I, I was afraid of seeds. I was afraid of nuts and I was afraid of avocados because they had fat. And that was my F word because this was oh, the yeah. fat free, low fat generation. So when I thought, and I was on the covers of all those fitness and health magazines. And looked great. And I looked. And yet, it was working, but not, right? But I thought I was in my yeah, We see it all the time. It was that skinny fat, right? You know, and yeah, on the yeah. inside, I was not healthy. And on the outside, fat on the inside. Um, for me, yeah. I think the, the biggest uh, revelation was uh, I do uh, frequently a public television uh, program, specials on, you know, on nutrition and metabolism. And every time I'll be up there, you know, giving my heart and soul saying that, you know, these are the foods to eat. These are the foods to avoid because, you know, we have epidemic of, of hypertension and, and type 2 diabetes and certainly obesity. And this is what you can do. And I'm pleading. There's an audience and everything, and they're not in their heads. And there's the camera crew and everybody. And then it's lunchtime, and it's nothing. Nothing happens. They call out, and the stuff arrives, and it's stuff you wouldn't even get. It's terrible. And I, I wonder why. You know what happens? What's the disconnect? And I think that's the operative word is there's a disconnect between the notion of the food that you're consuming and ultimately your health. I had a wonderful conversation this morning on uh, my podcast with a Dr. Annika Becca, who is oh, an yes. OBGYN. She was, she was a guest we, on Your Healthiest Healthy yeah, Community. She's too. terrific. Great. Uh, yeah. She is a love. And w we were talking about how foods that women eat affect their ease of menopause. And who knew? I mean, you know, the rest of the world knows these things. But here, I think there's a, there's a sense that we should live our lives however we want. And then when we get whatever the problem is, breast cancer, diabetes, you name it, someone's going to come along and fix it. We can keep going on our merry way. And you make very clear in your healthiest healthy that, uh, and again, calling out what your oncologist said, that it's up to us we have to take agency over our health prospect because a lot of times modern medicine, and I think, you know, especially here in America, it's great, but there are times when it's going to fail. I mean, you know, uh, we're not 100% anywhere near it as it relates to cancer. And in my world, we're failing miserably as it relates to Alzheimer's. So why don't we talk about what people can do to be their healthiest healthy, you know, to reach to do all those things. And so let's move on. Um, we talked about your diet, which, uh, hey, we've all been through that. For me, in residency, it was baby food. And I'll, no. why does, what do I mean by that? So, you know, the kitchen, the dining room's closed, the cafeteria's closed, it's three o'clock in the morning, you just get out of the operating room, you're really hungry, you hit the pediatrics floor, you open the refrigerator, and they have Gerber or whatever it was, baby food. Right. The banana um, something, banana coconut, was so good. <laughs> The reason it was so good is it had so much sugar in it. And oh, yeah. that's what we ate every single night. But anyway, so which we've is, all been Which there. is also, I mean, the fact that you just even bring that up is so baffling that this is what parents are taught to, teach, to feed to their kids from an early age. And that's why we all develop these habits of want that, you know, the taste buds wanting that sugar, wanting that salt, all the things, but it starts so young. It probably starts in utero for so many of us. Well, as a matter of fact, we are, our brains are hardwired to respond positively to sweet. That was a survival mechanism. It's what you and I talked about. Sweet, eat the fructose, raise uric acid, and you'll survive. So it's difficult to avoid, but you're right. I mean, there's less sugar in baby food now, gratefully, but in the day, oh, it was really sweet. And did I love it? Of course I did. Of course. Uh, you know, and that's exactly right. That gets kids primed for sweet and they would be satisfied for a little bit. And then, you know, good luck breaking them of that habit. And, and the other thing is, I'm sure you went through this, leaving the hospital with your children uh, as they are born, getting that bag of formula because, you know, you don't want to breastfeed. Uh, you want to get on formula right off the bat and have your breast milk uh, dry up, and that's what you're told to do. Yes. I was so, baffled by how many of my friends, and, you know, no judgments. We all have to make our own decisions, and some women aren't lucky enough to be able to breastfeed because of different biological um, issues. I was so grateful to be able to breastfeed, and I didn't realize then 
know, my kids are now 11 and 14. I had no idea how important it was for their health, for their microbiome, for my health. And I'm so grateful that I did it. I, the only thing is I wish I would have done it longer. I was, you know, after my first daughter, I was pregnant on Dancing with the Stars as the host. And I, um, I went back I had two jobs. I had a full-time entertainment news job at that time and Dancing with the Stars. I took three months off the entertainment news job, but Dancing with the Stars was two days a week. So I figured, okay, my baby can come while I'm you know, getting ready in hair and makeup some of the days, but otherwise two days a week for a really big show that's going to help put it through college. Well, well that'll, that'll work. So so I, I did that, but I was You're pumping. playing the long game. Yeah, I was playing the long game, exactly. But so what I was doing was I was pumping like crazy. So I would right. literally be in the makeup chair with a, a cape over me, and you could hear the zhing, zhing, zhing of the motor. The mag-mag. Of the it was called mag-mag, right? Exactly. I don't know if that's the one you had. And, and, I'll tell you, and I pumped so much that I had an entire freezer full of milk. So she went, I, at four months, though, I'd had three bouts of mastitis, which is so painful. And finally, my OBGYN said, you're done and my milk dried up, but she had another two months, literally just solely on frozen breast milk that I had stored away. But I would have liked to feed for a, for a whole year if I could. If my second, we got to six months because I was more careful with my pumping. But it's uh -huh. uh, it, it's a challenge, but I'm so grateful. And, and it's these things sometimes we don't know about that I wish they would tell you even in the hospital, here's why not you know breast is best. You know, here's why you should try it. And, and let me well, tell you- how do you suppose, weeks. why is it then that you walk out of the hospital with that bag? With the infant formula in it. I mean, you know, Big brands. what's involved here? Yeah. Lots of um, money. Lots of money. Given to the bet. hospitals. Uh, all of the money. Did you breastfeed? Uh, we're getting off topic, but did, did you breastfeed f through the mastitis? I did. I did. And that's, and that's what got to the third, the third bout of it. And, you know, it's, it's interesting too. So also for those who might be listening, who maybe haven't had their first child and they're thinking, gosh, when I do, should I breastfeed? I'll tell you, those first two weeks were so literally toe curling painful for me with my first daughter. She couldn't latch. Well, I don't know how I got through black, black and blue and bloodied, but then we broke through and it became the most, ma I sometimes miss it. It was such a magical thing to be able to do and to bond and to just to have that time with your child is just amazing. And you start to feel, you know, the, is it the oxy oxytocin? What gets released? All of a sudden you're breastfeeding and you feel amazing. It was great. It really was. Uh, I wish, I wish we'd had better education on that. I, hopefully it's better now, you know, all these years later. Yeah. Well, I, I want to get back to Katya so much, but a thought comes to mind. I, I'm imagining you, uh, with your daughter on the set, uh, and, uh, you said hair and makeup. So hair mm -hmm. and makeup have been something really pretty central in your life for a long time, predating the diagnosis of cancer. What do you think about that? So when I went into deep into research to find out why I got breast cancer, because I figured my dad had colon cancer. His mom lived to 95, but was a breast cancer survivor. So it must be hereditary. I'm a national ambassador for Susan G. Komen. And as part of that, I really dug into a lot of research on breast cancer. And of the one in eight women who will be diagnosed over the course of her lifetime with it, only five to 10% are actually genetic. So if we're looking at about 90% of people with breast cancer having nothing to do with heredity, and I found out from a battery beyond the BRCA testing, we did a lot of, of different genetic tests to find out if there was a connection because there is a breast and colon connection with cancer. I had no yeah. genetic link. So I was angry at first. I wanted a quick answer. And when I found out that I wasn't genetically linked to this breast cancer, why? Why did I get it? So in all the research that I did, I discovered what you well know, and, and I'm so grateful to people like you for giving us this great information when it comes to food, but it's what we've not only put in our body, which was, by the way, eye-opening to me because I didn't realize that, but it's also what we put on it and around us. And by around, I mean everything from our cleaning products to stressful, toxic relationships and how we handle stress and how we handle sleep or lack thereof, and all of these different areas. And that's, I thought I was my healthiest, but I realized I needed to be my healthiest healthy because I was healthy, but not my healthiest. And that's why the book is your healthiest healthy because I didn't have one comprehensive action plan that seemed to be out there to give me some guidance without getting onto a pedestal like a lot of people tend to do and say, this is how you have to do it. We need to figure out what works for us. We're bio individuals. What's going to work for me, whether it's nutritionally or with products I'm using might not work for someone else. So 
when it came to being in the makeup chair, this was shocking to me. I didn't realize the toxins, the you know, whether it was the the carcinogens, the endocrine disruptors, the neurotoxins that were in, or even just even allergens in these hair and makeup products that we, you don't have to be sitting in a makeup chair professionally every day. It's the, you know, the mom who's getting up to go get her kids off to school and slapping on some makeup or the power, you know, power woman or man who's putting on his personal care products to get him or her through the day. We're shellacking ourselves with so much crap that is sinking into our skin, that is absorbing into our lungs, that is seeping into our, you know, all of our responses with stress that is leading to inflammation in our body, leading to cancer, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease, not to mention all the neurodegenerative disorders that you talk about. And compromising immune function. We need a functional, uh, a, a, an appropriate immune function for identification of those early malignant cells, of course. Uh, it's a point well taken. And, you know, I think over the years, you know, there's been such there's been derogatory uh, comments made towards those of us who say, you know, eat organic food, for example. And I think that, um, you know, one of the reasons, for example, that we prefer to recommend non-GMO foods, leaving the fact that it's genetically modified aside for a moment, the reason, for example, that foods are genetically modified by and large is to allow the farmers to apply a poison then to kill the weeds to the food that we would then eat. And that poison, you know, that glyphosate, is <clears throat> threatens our microbiome. That's work of Dr. Stephanie Seneff. Uh, we've had her on the program. And uh, w as you mentioned in the book many times, a lot depends in terms of our immune function and capability on having really catering uh, to our gut bacteria. And I think, you know, central to the dietary plan that you developed for yourself was a diet that went much more into uh, appropriating good fiber for yourself, obviously with the goal to nurture your gut bacteria, to help us balance our immune systems and help us with detoxification in our exceedingly toxic world. I mean, make no mistake about it, there's a lot, there are a lot of toxicity issues that relate to breast cancer. And, you know, here you say that you didn't have any genetic predisposition uh, and, you know, by and large, that's, you know, there are certainly clear uh, can uh, cancers that are clearly related and syndromes that are clearly related um, to genetic issues. We, we know about those. We had to learn those in medical school. But beyond that, you know, by and large, most people aren't going to, are not going to have a genetic cause of cancer. Most people do not have a genetic cause of Alzheimer's disease. What does that tell us? It tells us that the other side of that coin is environment. It's therefore up to us to change that environment, make better choices. And you did one heck of a job, not just in the cosmetics department and calling out what commonly uh, people, women mostly, but men as well, are exposed to. But beyond that, the, the notion of cleaning our homes. You were a big proponent of white vinegar. I love white vinegar. It's very helpful. It's very cheap. You know, I think baking soda and white vinegar are probably two of the best. Don't mix them together. DIY. We used to love doing that. <laughs> right. No explosions. Not, yes. But, but they're, they're so, they're so great. And the fact that this was also, you know, again, eight years ago when I was diagnosed and starting to try to figure out how, well, gosh, I was used to my little babies crawling on the ground. So I'm spraying every single surface with the, the biggest chemical bomb possible because, oh gosh, we don't want them to have anything you know dirty in their mouths, not realizing that what I was putting on the floor that they were actually feeling and putting into their mouth was highly toxic. You know, all the big, big brands. And thankfully in these years, since I've been changing over my cleaning products, my beauty products, my makeup, my skincare, all of it, there has been a boom in the healthier, clean products industry, the natural products industry. And, and just slapping a label like organic doesn't necessarily mean it's free of That's all true. toxins. So I, I really, I caution people to, to really read labels and understand that, you know, the European Union bans about 1,400 different substances as possibly carcinogenic, known carcinogenic neurotoxins or endocrine disruptors. And those endocrine disruptors, you guys, are those things that mess with our hormones. And obviously, Dr. Perlmutter can talk a lot more as to why that's harmful and dangerous for us. But... The U.S. only bans 30. And by the way, it was only 13 up until a couple of years ago. And we haven't changed our 
FDA rules since 1938. And that's there's a right. bill that's been stuck in Congress for years that's trying to get the, the products, Personal Care Products Act passed, and it's not mm-hmm. happening because we these have big to be our own advocate. We've yes. got to learn this information. Again, your book is a wonder, wonderful resource. We've got to know this information. And what you just said, I think, is really very important because we would assume that you know, if there's a product on the shelf in a, in a store, it is safe. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, you know, getting back to glyphosate, you can go into any hardware store and buy Roundup and spray it all over anywhere you want. And, you know, those cases of cancer that are described, those class action lawsuits happened because there is a relationship. This is a, you know, a known carcinogen. It's, it's likely a human carcinogen. That's what the science is telling us. And yet, you know, other countries, I think, take it certainly a lot more seriously. But I think that a product should be proven safe rather than, you know, have the burden upon science to prove that it's risky. Uh, you know, it's approved for, I think it's guilty until proven innocent in my book. Right. Uh, we don't well, go it's through interesting. That. It, well, as you say, but uh, to that fact, even though there are lots of chemical ingredients that are proven to be safe by the FDA in a product up to a certain amount, what they're not taking into consideration is, for instance, the average woman uses about 12 different personal care products each day. If you were to line up all the ingredients on the ground, a lot, there'd be a lot of overlap, right? So maybe all 12 have one particular, have a paraben in it or some other sort of toxic ingredient. And maybe if you had just used the one product with the parabens, eh, okay, maybe it would have been okay. But day after day, layer after layer, it's about 158 different chemical substances that we are putting on our body again and again. And that's where the problem is. That's where the red flag, and that's why we have to take control reading labels and making sure we know what we're putting on our bodies and, and giving to our kids. You made a, a very good point about menstrual pads and tampons. Mm-hmm. Yes. And the risk involved with them based upon chemical exposure. Maybe you can walk us through that a little bit. Well, we were talking earlier about glyphosate. And when we think about cotton, the cotton crops are sprayed with a pesticide. I don't know if glyphosate is on every crop, but there are toxins that are being sprayed on those crops to to have that cotton, unless they are 100% organic cotton. So when it comes to your tampons and your pads, first of all, the area that you're putting them in has such thin skin that it's very permeable, which means that the chemicals in those products get into your bloodstream like that. So we really want to aim for 100% organic cotton pads and tampons. They also, bleach is used to get them as white as white can be. They, right. you know, they obviously a lot of have plastic applicators. We've all heard about the problems with plastic with the BPAs and many other petrochemicals that are in our plastics. So we really don't want to put them anywhere near. And for those of you who have daughters who are starting to approach or already currently in the menstrual cycle, I mean, I, this was something I was so grateful to learn about prior to my girls getting to this stage, because now they're starting from a point of knowledge right away. And I, I forget, I'm forgetting the statistic about, about the number over course of our lifetime of tampons and pads that we use, but it's in the tens of thousands. So we really want to be careful when it comes to that, the adhesive chemicals for the pads, but there are some really great alternatives out there that are safe and free of those toxins. Well, you mentioned just beyond pads and tampons. I mean, you mentioned the various other appliances uh, that women can use. Yes, it, you know it's so important. Well, you know whether and also when it comes to vaginal gels, when it comes to even even personal pleasure items, those all there are great websites that offer ones that are free from all of these toxic substances. And so it's just a matter, it, it, uh, thankfully it doesn't even take much more than a very quick Google search to be able to access all of this information. And I, I love having you know people as members of my Your Healthiest Healthy community who get to have sort of that one-on-one time with me to ask questions. And by the way, I'm really active on Instagram. If you guys have questions, you can always DM me on Instagram or you know add into my comments. It's at Samantha Harris TV. And I'm really take, I, I, it's so important for me to share with as many people as possible. So I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can to give you the insight and info. To okay. answer Where do they find you on Instagram? So Samantha Harris TV on both Instagram and Facebook, like television, Samantha Harris okay. TV. And if, you know, with any luck at all, we're going to see that right at the bottom of our screen right now. There you go. 
<laughs> I love it. You guys are so tech savvy. <laughs> you bet. Not me. Um, you know, one of the uh, very important uh, parts of the book I thought was um, the importance of communication. And you dedicated a section to communicating with children. And I, I cannot imagine um, how difficult that must have been for you. But the the learning that you did and then the you know, the knowledge that you gained and then being able to relate that to people in the book, I think is exceedingly valuable, but maybe a quick overview about how to deal with breaking the news to children and walking them through what's happened and what they could expect moving forward. Well, kids, of course, based on their ages, interpret information and hear information in different ways. And so how you talk to, for us, a three-year-old versus our six-year-old was very different. And had we had a teen at that time, how we would have shared that information with a teenager also is very different. So for instance, with our three-year-old, the, the most important thing that the, the toddlers want is they just want to know that mommy or daddy can pick them up and hug them and hold them and carry them. And I wanted to be able to put her in her crib after giving her a bottle, but I wasn't allowed to lift her for six weeks after each of the, of the surgeries. And so I wanted to make sure that wasn't interpreted as, well, mommy doesn't care about me, or mommy doesn't love me, or why am I not getting hugs? So how we told her was just that we explained my mom had had some back surgery recently, uh, right before I had my surgery. And so we were explaining how, you know, there's two reasons you have surgery. Either there's something that is um, not working inside you, or there's something that's there that shouldn't be there. So mommy has something that's there that shouldn't be there. The doctor's going to make it all gone, and but mommy has to find a different way to carry you you know, for a little bit. And so we did, she would climb on my back and I would shimmy over to the, thankfully she was three. So I could shimmy over to the crib and she'd crawl off my back and get into her crib. And that worked. And we also brought in different projects for them. We brought in, because I had to be in bed. I couldn't, literally couldn't get, wasn't allowed to get out of bed for more than 20 minutes every two hours for the first three weeks after each surgery. So we brought games and fun things. And we tried to make it more um, enjoyable for them and, and more and less scary. For the six-year-old, we figured she's never heard the word cancer before. We don't need to tell the th three-year-old the word cancer, but our six-year-old, we don't want her to hear it on the playground. Oh, I overheard my mommy saying, your mommy has cancer and having no idea what that would be. So we, again, delivered the information to her in a way that she could interpret it. And then with, you know, if you had a teenager, the teenager is going to quickly jump on Google and start right. looking it up for themselves and asking their friends. So delivering the information and giving really solid websites, say, hey, listen, if you're going to look it up, go to cancer.org or go to coman.org. These are great breast cancer sites that can give you accurate information and every cancer is different. So just because you see a story, you hear about someone who had something that was one way and went south, it doesn't mean that's what's going to happen to our trajectory. So that was really important to understand the delivery for each different age group. Well, in closing, I, I want to say that uh, at the end of your book, you, there's a call for us to uh, give generously. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think that there's so much to be said about that, about expressions of gratitude and to just be uh, in, a, in a place of, of giving back, of, you know, of, of recognizing what you've been given, what you've learned, and then giving back. And that you called for us to do that uh, in the book, and I think you did it in the book. This is a very, very generous uh, candid, tra uh, transparent um, approach to really helping many, many people. And I think uh, clearly that's what this is doing. So I'm really grateful that you did it. And uh, I know that there are plenty of people who are feeling the same way. So good on you. And uh, let me just ask you, what's next for Samantha Harris? What comes next? So your healthiest healthy community really grew out of the book. Uh, I started to take women on retreats, which I still do the Your Healthiest Healthy retreats a couple times a year, just a small group of women really intimate and involved. And, and we work on, it's really workshopping through all of this, but also figuring out what they need as individuals to change in their lives and then figuring out their why. Uh, but I launched Your Healthiest Healthy Community because I understand too, retreats aren't always accessible for everyone. And your position financially shouldn't preclude you from having access to really great information and support and community. So your healthiest healthy community is, which Dr. Perlmutter was a guest on every week. I bring in a live guest expert. I'm 
a certified health coach and a certified trainer. So I do a coaching session live once a week with live Q and a, and also a workout once a week. And then, uh, a Fridays we, we end the week and start the weekend with a breath work and meditation live actually on zoom. It's the only thing we do on zoom so we can really connect face to face. And it's been wonderful. It's really, I launched it in January of 2021 and it just keeps growing and it is a supportive and encouraging community. And I welcome anyone who has questions to just reach out to me. Way to go. Good job. Thank you for sharing your story and just sharing your time with us today, Samantha. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's great. I appreciate it. Thank you. I will come back anytime and I would love to have you back as well. I just enjoy my time with you. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. What a, what a story and what a storyteller. And what an amazing person. I've uh, been interviewed by Samantha on a couple of occasions in the past and have really grown to love her. She is a terrific individual. And I'm so proud of this book uh, that she has put out because it's so good. It's so user-friendly and it's so full of incredibly important information. I want to thank you for spending time with us today. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, and we will be back soon. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.